Dr. Tekor, sir, shall we start? One moment, ma'am. We are still going live on YouTube. The number of participants we are seeing is only on our panel. Uh, yes, yes. We don't see how many attendees are there. I'm sharing the YouTube link in the chat box. Okay. And uh, we can start now. Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya. Let the light of knowledge remove the darkness of ignorance. Warm greetings to all the esteemed POS members from Team POS 2021-22. I'm Dr. Rujuta Machwe, Secretary, Pune Ophthalmological Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all for this first international event of POS. Research is the distance between the idea and the realization, as we all know. It takes a dream to get started, a desire to keep going, and a determination to complete it. Many of us have got all the three virtues, but still we are stuck up somewhere as regards our research. And hence, let's hear today the pulse of wisdom from the stalwarts in the field of research. Before I proceed, I would just like to make a small announcement that during our POS annual conference, Spectrum 2021, we'll be having a different special kind of a session where the private practitioner ophthalmologists from POS would be presenting their research in one of the sessions. And the mentors would be the experienced POS members in the field of research. So today we are very fortunate to have with us Professor Dr. Harminder Singh Dua from the Queen's Medical Center, University of Nottingham, UK, who has been recently got appointed as the High Sheriff of Nottingham Shire 2021-22. Dr. Sabya Sachi Sen Gupta from Future Vision Eye Center, Mumbai, and founder of Sen Gupta Research Academy. Dr. Akshay Nair, oculoplastic surgeon from Mumbai, with immense experience in the field of research methodology. As panelists, we have got Dr. Udayan Dixit. He needs no introduction. He's a very senior member of POS and he's on the editorial board of JCOR, Journal of Clinical Ophthalmology and Research. And Dr. Mandan Paranspe from Pune, who's a reviewer of IGO, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Our moderator for today is Dr. Natasha Pahuja, cataract and refractive surgeon from Pune. After each presentation, there would be a 10 minute session of question answers. So you can put the questions in the chat box. And at the end, there would be a panel discussion. So without further ado, may I now request the Honorary President POS, Dr. Sanjay Tekode, to please introduce our first speaker. Over to you, Dr. Tekode, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Lujita. It's my honor to do this job. Professor Harminder Singh Dua, MBBS, DO, MS, MNMS, FRCS, FRCO, FRCP, MD, PhD, Chair and Professor of Ophthalmology at Queen's Medical Center. Nottingham. He served as head of service, Department of Ophthalmology, University of Nottingham. He was made commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire in 2019. He's a board member of ICU. He's a trustee of Sussex Eye Foundation. Currently, he's editor in chief of Journal of Duponia. He served as editor of BJO. He was the president of uh, Royal College of Ophthalmologists UK 2011-2014. He was the president and he is a founder member of UCORIA. He has over 125 awards and accolades, starting from National Science Talent Scholarship way back in 1968 in India to 
to being elected as honorary fellow of Royal College of Ophthalmologists UK, honorary fellow Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh and College of Optometrists UK. He was listed by the magazine Ophthalmologist in the top 20 most influential individuals in ophthalmology in 2014. He was one of the five ophthalmologists in Britain's top doctors published by the Time magazine. In his name, he has an eponymous lecture room, the Dua's lecture at Birmingham, and a PG seminar room, Dua's room. And friends, I'm happy to announce that the professor has been appointed as the High Sheriff of Nottinghamshire recently March 2021. It is indeed a great honor. And as the professor is joining us for the first time after this appointment, we give him a standing ovation. Congratulations, sir. He has supervised over 48 PhD and MD post students. He has published over 375 papers with more than 17,000 citations. His discovery of pre desmet layer, now globally accepted as Dua's layer, has revolutionized the understanding of corneal lamellar surgery and led to the innovation of three novel surgical procedures. Friends, this is research with application. He's a man with research and passion for research. I remember in my first presentation, in the RO meet way back in 2000. After my talk, the session sir chaired, he met me and said, how to go about these presentations? So he believes research is for everyone and research can be done anywhere. All you know, need to have is the power of observation and your eyes and mind. With this, I request Professor Dua, to deliver his talk on basics of research anywhere. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. A very kind and generous introduction. So let me get this going. Okay, so it's my pleasure to be here and to talk to a lot of people from different walks of medicine. I gather there are non-ophthalmologists, ophthalmologists, and uh, many of our ancillary service support uh, personnel will be listening. So welcome to all. And what I'm going to say will have obviously examples from ophthalmology, but they're applicable, the principles are applicable to anyone, anywhere. So some concepts, you know, the word search means to look for something and to find something by a thorough and careful process. Research is to look for something in a systematic manner or to conduct an investigation. And the various ways in which this starts, you can pose a question, you can, uh, make a hypothesis, and then you find the answer and you go about doing that step by step. You can confirm or refute a previous answer somebody has provided. You can add to the knowledge base. So it's not an answer to a question, but an extra bit of knowledge, which is always welcome and will be useful someday. Or you can find and establish something new, completely new, which nobody knew of. So all these are elements of research or outcomes of research. But often to find the answer or to go about achieving one of those four things I've listed, you have to search and search again. And attempts will fail. And I always tell my students, research is nine times failure and one time success. But that one time makes it worthwhile. And you have to keep searching again and again. And maybe that's why it's called research. A researcher is anyone who asks the questions. So anybody in the audience, uh, anywhere, can be and obviously or probably is a researcher 
only he doesn't know it. So if a woman is cooking food in the kitchen and then perfects a recipe by little more salt, little less chili, little more oil, etc., she's going through the steps of research till she has perfected it. Only she doesn't know she's doing research. And once she knows that, then it becomes a secret recipe. So that's called intellectual property. And if you ask her the recipe, she'll always tell you, but leave one ingredient out so that you can never make it perfect as she does. So protecting your intellectual property is part of research. And research is at the core of everything we do. You know, we drink a glass of water, we take it for granted, it's clean. We write with a pen, we take it for granted, but it is all a product of somebody's research. I'm told that they spent millions of dollars trying to perfect the pen that will write in space, this ballpoint pen, because there's no gravity and the ink doesn't come down the pen. But the Russians just use the pencil instead. So research also has its pitfalls and, and you have to target your efforts in the right direction. The types of research and from our medical point of view can be clinical and the simplest is a case report. Many, many major papers start with a case report. Don't forget the importance of a case report. Then you have case series. So when you find one report, you, you call it a case report. When you find two, you have, you know, as they say, case after case, and when you have more than two, you make it a series, and they can be random. It can be one after the other after the other. So that then becomes a case series. It can be a cross-sectional study, means you're looking at a picture or an occurrence at one point in time across a certain group of patients or a certain part of the population. It can be case control studies where you take a patient very similar to the other in age, gender, disease duration, et cetera, and treat with one uh, medicine and the other you don't treat and see, or treat with another medicine, see how they do. And it can be a cohort study, means you look at one group of patients and you follow them up over a long period of time. It's also called the longitudinal study. So you're looking at the same patients over time and that then becomes a cohort study. And then, of course, you have the gold standard, which are clinical trials. They can be non-randomized, randomized. randomized. They're blinded, double-blinded. So a double-blinded, randomized clinical trial is what we consider a, the gold standard in clinical research. Uh, so if you look at this list, all these highlighted items, anybody can do anyway. You don't have to have a research laboratory or even a major research facility. Case control studies, you need a little more documentation, a little more planning, a little more time. But then cohort studies and clinical trials, they are very rigid um, protocols which you have to establish and follow them and you need extra staff. But at least 50% of that list you can do anyway. Basic laboratory research, a little more complicated. There are many techniques, and with the advancement of technology, the way it's going, there are so many different techniques covering biochemistry, molecular sciences, immunohistology, pathology, etc. You can do it without or with animals. And ex vivo, meaning you'll use animal or human living tissue, but not living animals. So if you take, an, for example, an eye or a cornea and you work on it, then it's ex vivo. And then you have translational studies where you take some of this knowledge you generated in the laboratory and apply it clinically. Uh, so the bench research and very basic research all the way to translational research and clinical trials is a whole spectrum, it's a continuum. And you can begin at any point and take it further from there. Uh, now, if you look at Laboratory research, not many are highlighted in, in yellow because they are a little more complicated to do, but ex vivo, I put it green, so it's 50-50. Some of you might be able to do it, particularly if you are associated with a pathology lab, you can do some basic studies. Translational studies, again, if somebody has done the basic and gives you a product or an idea or a technique to try and patients, then you could probably do that. What the outcome of all this research has to be is to disseminate the knowledge that you have gained or generated. And that comes in various forms. 
in one word, you have to publish that result. And it can be editorials, case reports, photo essays, e-letter, and that list is long. Not everything is included over there. But if you look at this list, and you see almost all of it is highlighted. So even from what I showed you earlier you can do, you can generate any of these kinds of publications in most journals because they all have, nowadays few journals take case reports, but there are many journals which are case reports only. So there's always a home for publication of the information that you have uh, generated or gathered. So what, what do you have to do? The first thing is read. Keep yourself up to date because what you will find is that the same idea has come to more than one person. And you might find that what you are doing, others are also doing. So keep up to date in your field or if you're trying to do research in some area, then go and read up more about it. And the best way to do is find a review article which is relatively recent and go and read that review article. And once you've read that article, you will have all the recent references and information. And from that, you will know what has been done, what the missing bits are, and how you can take that further. And be curious, ask questions, and ask questions not of the audience, of yourself. Ask yourself the question, and I'll give you examples. And document everything as much as you can. This is the core, it's at the very core of research. If you have not documented, then you cannot put together information later. And you have to have proper note keeping, performers, clinical record forms, and you have to have the full history. If you get a patient of cataract, you say, oh, why should I ask them if he's got high diabetes or hypertension or what medications he's taken otherwise? No, you have to document all of that and have a system. My system is, I think, anatomic. I start with the head posture, forehead, eyebrows, go all the way down back to the retina, ocular movements, nasal acmal passage, even if it is a patient with a cataract, so that you've not missed anything. I remember when my, one of my fellows started um, with me, uh, I, on his first day, I said, take a look at this patient. So he looked at the patient, looked and said, oh, this is uh, corneal dystrophy of some kind. I said, well done, spoken like a fellow. Now think you're an SHO, go back and look at the patient. So he looked at the patient, then he stood up at me, head down and said, it's a hypopion corneal ulcer. I said, yes, uh, you have to examine your cornea. Fellow doesn't mean you just examine the cornea. Uh, you have to examine the whole eye. And not only that, you have to examine the whole patient. And quite apart from that, I said, never diagnose a dystrophy by looking at one eye only, which was the other mistake. So always examine the whole, just our tendency is to, go straight where the pathology is very obvious and we forget the structures in front of it and the structures behind it and miss a lot of things. So it has part of good clinical practice, but from good clinical practice, you can generate a lot of good research. And do test where possible. Now, ophthalmology is a very, very visual science, even from the, uh, from the observer's point of view. And we have so much technology to take images and whatever you have and whatever resources you have, use them wherever relevant and capture those images and store them because they will come in very handy when you want to later publish that, that case, who at the time you don't know is interesting, but will become later if you follow that patient up. And this is something which we're not very good at. You have to do a complete physical exam of the patient as well. Uh, if you can't do it yourself, get a colleague's help. So just a general medical examination is very important because sometimes these clinical associations only come by looking at, at, at that. And, the, you know, patients got retinal artery occlusion, but they might have other thrombotic problems elsewhere in the body. And you will only make that association if you've done the, the systemic examination. So this is one of my often quoted sentences, the eye is an organ located in the orbit, which is part of the skull, which houses the brain, which is connected to the eye and the rest of the body via the neck. And together they represent the patient. And don't forget the patient. Examine the patient as a whole, not just the eye. Treat the patient, not just the eye. And you must know what the patient thinks, not what you think the patient is thinking. Very important to keep the patient's perspective. And ophthalmology is one specialty where we always have something between us and the patient. 
And this often, instead of making our examination better and enhancing it, makes it worse because we miss things like this. So the best thing to do is move all equipment out, even your slit lamp, and have a good look at the patient's face and the rest of the patient, the hands, the rheumatoid, whatever, without any instrument intervening. And then trust your power of observation. If you see something that you don't understand, don't just brush it aside, document it. Don't ignore what you see. Don't say, oh, I'm seeing something, or this might not be real. People make fun of me. If I say I see, just document it. If you can take a picture, take it. And this is what uh, your president uh, alluded to, the power of observation. We know that the eye cannot see what the mind doesn't know. This was in Boyd's textbook of pathology that um, we've always taught this sentence came up a few times, and that is true. Uh, but what the eye doesn't see and the mind doesn't know doesn't exist. And this is D.H. Lawrence's play of words on the same concept. So if you don't see it and you don't know it's there, for you, it doesn't exist. But there's a difference in seeing versus looking. Only one can, when one can look at something and see beyond what the mind knows, can new discoveries be made. And that is how Archimedes discovered the, the, the rule of flotation. That is how we find that Newton discovered gravity with the apple falling. Many people had seen the apple falling before him, but nobody stopped to ask the question, why is it falling? And the same with Alexander Fleming's penicillin. Uh, you know, why, where there is contamination, there is no bacterial growth. And the contamination was the discovery which most, most, most people used to throw away. So taking a moment to pause and think of what you see is all what is needed to allow the eye to see what the mind doesn't know. Lot of progress in medicine and science is made by serendipity, by chance, by accident. And there are many, many examples. If you just put serendipity in science on Google and you will see so many startling examples of something we take for granted today came from little laboratory accidents. And you don't need massive equipment or kits to do research. And I'm going to, this thing, something I've showed many times. So when we see an abrasion, we measure the abrasion. But just looking at this abrasion, you know, glass is half empty or half full. So not why you have an abrasion in the middle, but why this part has survived. And looking at that and following these patients, we came up with the rules of coronal epithelial wound healing. The circular abrasion does not heal by forming circles of small diameters but you get these convex fronts, they make geometrical shapes. Here's a pentagon, here's a quadrilateral, which they finally then form these pseudotendritic or Y-shaped contact lines, as you see over here and over here. So another example here, you can see when the limbus is involved, it's a slightly different process. You get circumferential migration, the circumferential migrating tongues of epithelium meet. Then when the limbus is completely re-epithelialized, it becomes like an abrasion with the limbus intact, and then it follows the same set of rules and it heals quite normally. And this, these little observations actually help to establish these rules of coronal epithelial wound healing. Another example where the limbus was involved, the circumferential migrating tongues meet, and then there's that little contact line, and when that will heal inwards, you get this Y-shaped line, and that's the rule over there. So when I first presented this data many, many years ago in Scotland, Dr. John Williamson, a consultant, and I was a senior house officer, he said, you have reaffirmed my belief that to do research, all you need is an eye and a brain. So you don't need fancy equipment. And this is one of my most popular pieces of research, which came by just simple observation. But you don't stop when you can make one conclusion. Just see it through and you'll find there's a lot more to be discovered. And what we discovered was that while this is healing from the limbus following those rules, you find the conjunctiva is approaching the cornea. The conjunctiva can cross the cornea and cause a mixture of conjunctival corneal epithelium leading to now what we know as stem cell deficiency. So you can stop that by scraping that away before it crosses or after it has crosses, the cross to get normal uh, epithelial cover for the cornea. And that then became this procedure called sequential sector conjunctival epithelectomy. So there's a lot of conjunctivalized cornea. You can take away the epithelium and then let the remaining epithelium grow 
to cover the surface, uh, cover the pupil and get normal vision restored. So simple, very simple techniques, very simple observation. Even this one, you know, we saw this patient, very red eye, there was conjunctival staining. And then you do a proper examination to ask the patient to look down and the upper part has not stained. And so that's strange. And what disease would do that? Turns out it was drug toxicity. So we published this up down sign of drug toxicity. And uh, these were with antibiotic, but any drug toxicity can cause this. They look up, it's clear, look at the bottom, it's red. So very, very simple. And it resulted in the paper. And it's something now which helps us uh, and guides us clinically. And same point, you know, when I was in India, uh, I was a lecturer and Nilawar was doing his MS thesis, a, a good friend now in practicing Chandrapur. And we, we, we found that granulomas can be treated by injecting steroids in, in, in the granuloma, intralesional injection. So why can't we do that with chalasia? And we did that and we found we could um, cure chalasia by injecting steroids. And we tried to uh, publish this in the AJO they said we'll accept it as a letter instead of a paper. So his whole thesis became only a letter, but we published it as a letter. And many people after that have gone and done that and proved that. So you can, like I said, you can refute or prove somebody else's work if it is coming new, and that is also research. So simple ideas, simple techniques, no massive kit needed. Now, I could stop here and if we were face to face, I would have, how many of you have seen these kind of images, these patients? Now, we would pass it off as telegym. Wait a minute, telegym means wing-like. This is not quite wing-like. And if you look at this over here and you look at this over here, and we studied these in a number of patients because we started documenting these. And then we call this diffuse keratoconjunctival proliferation because it's not a degeneration. The paper accepted an archive because it's, a, in a, a first cousin of telegium, but not the same thing as shown by histology and other techniques. There is more elastotic degeneration uh, in, in telegium, but there's more collagenous degeneration in this condition, although clinically they look the same. So a, a new clinical entity. And whenever in those days, when we first discovered this, in any meeting I would show, at least 15 to 20 people from the audience would raise their hand to show, yes, they have seen it. I said, then why didn't you stop to think about it? Why didn't you do something of this observation? We should always just one of those things and we left it. But as you can see, don't do that. When you make an observation, trust your observation, document it and leave it till you see again another, another patient comes, another comes, then you've got something you are onto. Again, I'm not going to go into detail. Everybody knows about the story of how the doer's layer was discovered, uh, the predestined layer, and all the, the clues that, that led up to this. And it is, again, no mega science. It's not huge technology. It is just simple observations. Why is the decimus membrane so resilient? Why is it so strong? You know, uh, we thought decimus very weak. When you put a suture in a cornea, and you go really deep, you see this edge, and you say, oh, that edge there, you see on either side of the needle is due to the desmids. But when I peel off the desmids membrane, like is over here, and then I put a suture in, and you can see that when you're putting that suture in, you still see that edge. So when you peel the desmids off, why should I see that edge? And then you know, well, there's something else there. There's another layer that's producing that edge. And these were clues that added up to become a new discovery, no fancy equipment. And while that video is running to show when you peel off the desmus membrane, uh, there is uh, the layer underneath. And this is what I call my Eureka moment. I've presented this many, many times. And I, these are the comments I've got. I'm not surprised you discovered the layer. I'm surprised why I did not. I see this under my eyes every day. And this happens to a lot of us. And I'm just telling you what I've seen. I'm not telling you what I've missed because I don't know what I've missed. And there will be hundreds of little observations that I've ignored and missed, which somebody else will discover. And there's a lot waiting there to be discovered and, and to be analyzed. And Dr. Busin, he said, you know, there was an instance when I was doing endothelial graft by taking this layer producing DMEC with air. And there, I found they were always thicker on the OCT than DMEC, which was mechanically peeled. 
And if I had stopped to think about it, it would have now been called Busan layer. So everybody afterwards go back and say, you know, why didn't I think of this? And that is because we have to give that extra time uh, and document it and then have, have a free moment now and again on a Saturday or evening, look at what you've documented and try and make some sense of it. And this commonest thing I hear, oh, all the easy things are done. No, that's not true. There's a lot more easy things waiting just for you to give it time and attention. And all that is said and published in textbook is not necessarily correct. So don't believe everything because there's a lot. And I found in my career so many things that are not, not correct. And this is important. Keep a folder of funny cases. And I have one. You know, Whenever I take pictures and document the patient's details, I don't understand. I don't. This is one I still don't understand. And if somebody knows the answer, I'll be very happy to hear. Very congested heart conjunctival, but there's a suture line. See, there's a suture line. This side completely normal, and they're extremely congested. What's going on here? You know, so I'm just I've just kept it. Now, everybody in the audience in India will recognize this. And this was a small observation on the patient's eye. The patient's name is Muhammad Murad, and he has this beautiful Om sign, and that is in the negative the contrast image. Uh, and it was on the no, it's not a disease, just a a freak malformation of this, maybe not freaks, it's God's message. And I then took this in the BJO cover image when I was editor, the writing is on the eye in the BJO cover 2010. So even a simple thing like that, all it needed is a picture can be a publication. So we all can use lots of our data to publish. And this is my other collection of some of these funny cases that I've got. I thought this patient is a cornea graft, but doesn't. And there's that, that kind of a line. This was blue paint that got embedded. And these are some concretions that have pigmented concretions. This turned out to be uh, uh, what referred to me as lattice was actually calcified corneal nerves. We published that. This is annular Salzman. Again, from the collection, we were able to publish that. And here you can see this funny little loop. Nothing else wrong. And this is the enhanced view of that loop. So is this just an exaggerated limbal vasculature loop or what is it? And, and again, this one, I have no idea. It doesn't look, uh, it looks calcified, but really prominent on the eye. So you keep, you keep a collection and one day you will find it's either a case report or it's uh, a collection that will become a case series. So keep your notebook of idea, ideas and follow up your cases. Very important, you know, so many of times papers get rejected from colleagues because there is no follow-up. So a good paper can come from good follow-up. If you've recorded all your cases and you look at the data from time to time and evaluate it, it becomes a publication. There's a difference between research and audit, but both can be published. So in research, ask the question, what should I do? Audit, ask the question, am I doing it? So if you think that the gold standard technique to do a certain procedure is this, or a certain disease treatment is this, then you do it. And after you've done 5, 10, 15, 100 cases, you've got all the follow-up and you look at your results and you compare your results with what is published out there in the literature. And if you're getting as good or better, you're doing something different. So your audit shows that you are doing something which is good and it's worth telling the world because the published results are 70%, yours are 90%. Or it may be the other way around, that the published results are 90 and yours are 70. So you're not doing something right. So you try and analyze and see where it's wrong. You change one step, one parameter, do it again, and then you can get your collect uh, your patients and see if you made a difference. So all that is publishable material, and you just have to look at your patients systematically. You don't have to do anything more. How many times in your practice have you asked yourself this question? There must be another way of doing this. There must be an easier way of doing this. There's got to be a better way of doing this. This you can do it quicker. Why does it take long? Don't wait for somebody else to find the answers. You know, they are just as clever as you are. You find that other easier, better, quicker way to do that thing. And you've got a paper in your hand. So it's even if a simple thing as cataract surgery that you're doing, if you think you know, there must be an easier, you know, we used to always say about rexes, you know, must be an easier way to do this. So people then came up with the electrical or the, the, the heat sort of quarter way of doing it. So anything you think of, you try and find your own answer. And you will find that be very novel, groundbreaking research 
Uh, and I've not even told you of a single paper of my laboratory research. All that I'm showing you is very simple clinical examples of how you can publish something which is very important and makes a difference. And remember that what you learn from overseas research may not apply to your patients. And this is so massive with the difference sometimes that in Japan, they would not uh, uh, license a drug until a certain percentage of the trial patients were Japanese. So you find what is best for your patients. And this is my most famous quote as we come to the end. To ask a question is the beginning of learning. To answer the question is a test of knowledge. And to question the answer is the start of wisdom. Now, all my life I spent talking about stem cells and how important the limbus is to keep the corneal epithelium going. And then these patients come along, completely destroyed limbus. There is no limbus, but the central epithelium has survived. It is not dying off. And what's going on here? You know, So you question the answers which you have provided, and you find that the limbus is not important in normal physiological turnover of the central epithelium in many cases. But if there's injury or damage to this epithelium, there is no place from where new epithelium will come. So the importance of the limbus becomes much more in replenishing and repairing damage than in the normal turnover, which can be sustained by the central epithelium for a long time. So keep your patients at the center of everything. These patients will teach you more than anyone else can. So just as those seven patients completely turned on its head the concept of the limbus in normal sustenance of the epithelium and maintenance of epithelial turnover, you will find patients are always telling you something. The patient's eyes, the patient's histories, the patient, any organ is giving you signals, clues, only you have to be patient enough to pick it up and then explore it further, not ignore it. They will reward you as nobody else can. They will think you are God. You have to prove them right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dua. That was an absolutely brilliant talk. Um, I, I think uh, the most profound talk that I've heard in, in the longest time, it, it just, it's just vibrating, uh, saying that you have to be more mindful. And something as simple as observation can, can give you such wonderful results. Um, also, one thing that reminds me after your talk is that um, I've always done it this way, won't open new doors for you. So we have to change our perspective and open our eyes truly. Um, do we have any questions uh, from the panelists? Or any comments from the panelists? Sorry, Natasha, I'll ask uh, Prof one question. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes you are. Sir. Uh, Prof, I wanted to ask you that <clears throat> decades ago when we were uh, doing MS or in the early days after MS, <clears throat> many conferences used to have lot of presentations where truly there were anecdotal reports. I saw five cases of something, but just presented in a good way, they were accepted. And now we have come a long way that uh, are the randomized control trials and the gold standards. But many a times we observe that in these very strict studies, there are a lot of inclusion and exclusion criteria, which are not met with in our uh, real life scenario, real world scenario. And we see a lot of articles these days that RCT show something, but when some registries are uh, seen, uh, the uh, real world scenario is different. So do you think in this uh, era of RCTs and everything, still something which is done as an anecdotal report over a period of time, no doubt done methodically, still has a value? Absolutely. It has, uh, I mean, I, will, I wanted to stick to time now, and, you know, uh, I will just give you this example. I mean, I haven't got, I'm not going to illustrate with images that how many years have passed, you know, almost a hundred since we've been looking at Desmus membrane detachment, right? And one patient came uh, after cataract, five months after cataract and the Desmus membrane detachment clearly visible on OCT and it's not clearing. 
My colleague even put air, it went back, and as soon as the air went, it came right back. We went back and looked at the same OCTs that he had looked, but we had in mind this predesmitch layer that, and we looked carefully and we found that both the layers had detached, you know, and the predesmitch layer had spontaneously come off with the desmus membrane and the endothelium. And we reported that one case in I, clinical application of the predesmitch, the first clinical relevance. And then we started looking at all the desmus membrane detachments and together with uh, Dr. S uh, Sina from uh, our RP Center. And then we had, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Sharon, Sh Sharon D'Souza. So the I Indian doctors contributed more patients than we did. And we completely changed our understanding of desmus membrane detachment. And we know just like you have the type one, type two and mixed bubbles, desmus detachment is type one, type two and mixed and that there's a spontaneous separation of the pre dismissed layer. And that's a paper in the AGO published last year. So, and confirmed by histopathology in five cases. So two lessons there. One, the case report was the start of something we have missed for 100 years, right? And that simple observe, if you had, people I'm sure on OCT have seen those two lines and have seen the separations, but they've said, oh, there's a split in Desmes, or they've ignored it, but they haven't re-looked it in the light of the new knowledge, and we missed it. So I just say that case reports are the starting point of many, many, many great things. Wonderful. So there's one question uh, from the audience, uh, which, uh, how, do you, how do you make up for the time required for fulfilling requirements around paper submission? This is by Dr. Preeti Jain. Yeah, time. I sleep four hours a day. <laughs> it's not a good recommendation, uh, but there are days when that happens and quite often. I can cope with that less now, but you need time. You need a team and the team makes up for the time. So involve other people, give them tasks, make them do it. And they will get a paper in as well. They will do that. So that's very important. And... Uh, Writing the paper, and always say this, you know, writing the paper and submitting and getting it published is as much work as doing it. Okay. All the, the data collection and everything and, and, and analysis is this much work. That much, sometimes more, is writing it because it will go, it will be rejected, the reviewers will say something, you change it again, and then you have to submit it to another journal and they have to reform it. It's a lot of physical work, but it has to be done. And then you can, okay, you find the references, you do the images and label the images, find the legends, and you have three or four people you need to combine them. So team working has become much more important. There was a question I saw about somebody saying uh, about statistics. Now, my statistical knowledge is zero, but doesn't mean that I don't publish with statistics. I just have a statistician in my team. And you have, you will find around, there will be a statistician. That's their job. And they're very good at it. So I don't want to learn and try and do their job bring him in. And what you'll find is that, like there's a pathologist, bring him in. Whatever you want, just broaden your horizon, broaden your team, and you will find you get better and better papers. Just to follow up to that question is asked by Dr. Ditte Kelkar. He said he's worked with you a long time ago. Um, he said, how much of your time out of your clinical practice do you dedicate for research? See, that, that is the... Um, it's a very... Um, Again, it's, it's a preconceived notion. Now, I can tell you this, that I have about 400 plus publications and uh, I may have about maybe close to 200 of very basic science, laboratory science public papers, because we do a lot of that. But I might have given thousands of lectures all over the world. Maybe only a dozen or two dozen are on the basic science. Nobody invites me to give antimicrobial peptides, right? Because it doesn't interest most people. Most people are practicing clinicians. So where do I do my clinical research from? From my day-to-day -day clinical practice. So all you're sure. doing is keeping your mind and your eye open. And whenever you spot the extra effort I make as I go and take a photograph. I used to do it myself. Now I have a slit lab right there with the camera on it. So uh, all my 
archaeologists to say they make a joke. Oh, as proper, he must be in the photographic room. So the the idea is document as best as you can in your normal practice. So you're doing your research. Yes, you will see maybe two patients less because you're spending more time with each each patient. But you're not doing every patient. Uh, when you see something unusual, then definitely spend a little more time, and that is how you will collect the data. Then on a weekend or sometime when you sit to analyze it, put it together, that's extra time. So it can be done. You don't have to have the notion, the preconceived notion, with big equipment, and you need a lot of time. In your just take it in your stride in your normal clinical practice. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, excellent uh, uh, talk. And as always, uh, after having listened to you many, many times, you always come out with something very uh, uh, useful. This is from a perspective of an individual practitioner in India, a typical situation that we all face. And uh, there are a lot of impediments to doing the actual research, documenting onwards. Uh, do you have any suggestions for uh, the individual practitioner's point of view practicing in india with all the uh, all the shortcomings that we face yes so uh, what what you do is um, if you are working in say you know nowadays we are all sort of specialized so we will do our field as a whole but develop a special interest in one part it might not be only one you can have two you can do cornea and retina you can do cataract and cornea but if you have a special interest where you're a little more focused and then get what you think is basic. In the past, you know, I have got still in my bag these color pencils. I used to draw with different color coding changes in the corner. There's a system for that. Nowadays, we have a slit lab photograph cameras. So if you have a photographic camera and nowadays there are iPhone adapters, which you can put on your slit lamp and get very good images. So use these kind of cheap but efficient modalities to document. When I say document, not just writing, but even imaging. If you've got just that basic to start with, then you will find that you will generate case reports or case series very easily. And when you come upon, upon something interesting, then get people in, get support. If you want to do a surgery and send the specimen for pathology and get the pathologist involved, or if you think that it requires very specialized um, imaging, then get that involved or somebody who has that involved and then start from whatever you have and build. Nobody starts with having everything because you'll never start. It's like saying, you know, I'll wait for the best computer to come along before I buy one. You'll never buy one because they're always changing every three months, six months. So you start with the basic one and then get going and see what you can. You'll be surprised how much you can do with very little. But you just need to have that determination to do it. Even with what you've got, you will find you can you can publish stuff. And there is and a slide around you. Sorry, I mean, so I get so many queries from India, so many people. Oh, we found this. What do you think? What do you think about this? I said, Oh, yes, you can give it this little twist, you know, look at it this way, find this, and write it as a case report. So if you are unsure in the early stages, ask. There's a lot of senior people who are happy to help you. Thank you. There is one slightly different question. How has COVID changed your uh, research uh, work or research work overall all over the world? Yes, it has. It has changed it quite significantly. Uh, laboratory research, at least in, where, where I work, you know, for a long time, laboratories were shut because of the social distancing and the cleaning. And then when they opened them, people, half the number of staff could come because they have to stay at that two meters apart and you can't have more than two people in this room, only one per person in that room. All that had a significant impact. Um, patients, you know, uh, a lot of the clinical research is with patients and they, you, you couldn't recruit patients for clinical trials uh, and that took a hit. A uh, lot of funding was now used elsewhere. So funding which was available was difficult. So all over the world, there have been um, problems, but COVID-related research was first priority and took off in a big way. There's so many papers you're seeing in New England Journal, Lancet, everywhere. People are doing a lot of COVID research very rapidly and publishing. So sometimes it's opportunistic to 
as eye doctors, we could have looked at, you know, people have done it even. And Jing Tawa is one of the, the, the sources of portals of entry of the virus. So you can look for the, 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 the receptors in the conjunctiva, you can look for conjunctivitis, you can look for, I was saying earlier, you're getting COVID related, you know, exacerbation of uh, repetic IDs, COVID vaccination related. And so there's so, so much more opportunity in something which is brand new, nobody knows anything about. And if you start documenting properly, you'll find you'll have several papers quickly, COVID related eye manifestation, either the disease or the vaccination. Um, you you said that documentation is the key essence of your uh, entire research. Do you have a different consent form that you ask the patients to sign just at the entry, or is it just that you select these patients? So yes, so for all the pictures that they have the photos taken, um, they they we used to have always that your 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 um, photograph may be used for teaching and publication purposes as standard. And now there is also this presumed consent. So if you are letting yourself be subjected to a image or a procedure, then you must have given your consent, otherwise you'd have fought it off. So for simple things, we don't always take a consent, but we, we do, uh, as far as possible, do take a consent. And even in the uh, surgical, you know, every surgical tissue that you remove, there, there's a little line there that your, your tissue removed might be used for research or for uh, histopathological examination or whatever. So that is there and, and they, they point that out to them and they sign it. But this consent is more important when you come to case reports because many journals will have their own standard performer of the consent, particularly if the patient is identifiable. So, you know, normally you, you cover the eyes and that's okay, but we have to show only the eyes. So it becomes difficult. So you then take that performer, you have to find the patient, get them to re-sign that consent form when it comes to publication. Okay. Um, so also uh, you said for a case series, which are more than three cases, do you need um, an um, IRB approval for it or just cases are okay if you just publish them? Again, that's a gray area. So what we do is that if, if you are, if you are, um, you've documented one case, you've documented another, you've documented the third, and some journals, I know, for example, journal I will not publish a single case, but you have three or more, they will uh, look at it. So then we do is we go back and then we publish it as a retrospective case series. So then it becomes like an, or you become like an audit. And then the right. uh, onus of IRB approval is not that stringent. If it's a retrospective three cases, it's very easy to get. And then sometimes you just talk to the chairman and they'll say, yeah, that's okay. Or you don't need, or if it's a retrospective audit. So we publish a lot of things which we're doing and then we want to publish and we publish it as a healthcare improvement. We have various different kinds of audits. You apply online and uh, almost within a week you get a number so you don't have to do a proper ethics submission but that is another area which is very important and where it's needed it shouldn't be ignored the ethical approval and the other thing that's come up for clinical research is patient public and even for basic research patient public involvement in research it's a big thing now in the west uh, and you have to uh, see the patient's perspective, how they would want even the research design uh, uh, has to be, has to have some input from, from patients in the public. We still have a lot of uh, questions pouring in, sir. Um, uh, we can take those questions because we are up with the 10 minutes discussion. Uh, yeah. We can take the questions uh, a little bit later. Yeah. If that's okay with you, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Uh, right. So, uh, with that uh, wonderful discussion and uh, a detailed talk, a very, very informative, a very simplified talk uh, for the clinicians, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. It's going to be a Herculean task just to introduce our next speaker. I'm going to share my screen just one second. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sabyasachi Sen Gupta. Um, so he's a VR surgeon and practicing in Mumbai. 
he is currently the associate editor of uh, indian journal of ophthalmology um he's done his uh, do in jipmer and bnb in arbit uh he has also done a research cum clinical fellowship from shankar nitrale followed by which he did uh, his research fellowship at wilmer john hopkins um he's been awarded the mccartney prize by the royal college of ophthalmologists in london and uh, he happens to be one of the well the first ever non british national to receive this award um he's also won the gold medal in dnb and he had he was head of research in arvind pondicherry he has published more than 90 publications uh and he's also um the founder of sen gupta's research academy and it's one of the kind portal for e learning and lectures um I, if i dare say i've heard him speak and he's just one gentleman who would simplify statistics and and research to the absolute basics and uh, it's an honor to have you dr sen gupta I'll stop sharing my screen, and uh, I would like to invite you for your talk. Thank you, Natasha, and very good evening to all of you. And first of all, I would like to thank the Pune Ophthalmological Society for giving me this opportunity to be here and you know share some of my insights with all of you. And I think the Herculean task is to follow Professor Dua, and uh, you know it really is uh, a huge privilege and honor to be able to speak on a podium with Professor Professor Dua. So, if my slides are visible, I'll uh, you know I'll go ahead. Yes, yes. Okay. So you know what was given to me was how to review your own paper before submitting. You know, so I think it's a journey, like you know, like life is. And you know what was given to me, as you can see here, is the point number three, that is review, submit, and publish. But I think the journey really begins with planning the study and executing it, and then uh, you know, analyzing and writing it up. And that sometimes is more of a Herculean task, as uh, Professor Dua has already told us. so this road map is something that you know we'll go through and we'll see you know how you arrive at that uh, review and publish section and how you how actually publish it you know before that you know because this is all a journey i thought i'll share a little bit of my own journey and you know my journey started with attending a research methodology workshop you know that's me and way back in 2008 uh, you know and uh, but then uh, you know i i got the biggest message through my training is that you really need to train yourself i think it's the most crucial aspect like like anything else in life and you know there is this you know a lot of this uh, uh, you know management books talk about the 10000 hour rule that is if you repeat something over and over again uh, for 10000 hours you are you are really an expert now so i think you know most of our people who are uh, you know listening today are physicians and are have already spent 10000 hours either operating or you know reading ecgs or looking at uh, patients but you know research is something that we uh, might not have spent enough time over so you know after that course uh, in 2008 at arvin you know i still wasn't satisfied so at 2010 i went to cmc velour which has which is one of the major uh, you know research training institutions in india and i sp spent a whole week training there i still wasn't satisfied so i went to wilmer and i spent a little over a year going through all the nitty gritties and i learned along the way i was exposed to a lot of crucial aspects of clinical research about biostatistics about manuscript writing and now as the associate editor of the indian journal of ophthalmology my learning still continues and so i think the i think the first message i want to give is get trained in basic concepts you know it's uh, for ophthalmologists you will probably understand this better is trying to publish without training is almost like inserting an intraocular lens without an incision so you know nowadays with a lot of technology lot of courses which are available easily you can actually look at some of those uh, to get trained you know there are lots of students who are doing this you can interact brainstorm with a lot of people uh, you know you can get in touch with a uh, lot of seniors like professor dua has already told us um, and you know because there are lots of courses also there are lots of teachers who are doing that so choose wisely because uh, you know a wrong teacher might set you back many years i think it's especially relevant for non institutional practitioners because you know this kind of training is not easily available when you're outside an institution so you need to look elsewhere and you know you, you could look at my website or many other resources for some of these uh, you know uh, learning courses so you know after this I, i thought you know we'll discuss about why we should do this research and publications how we should do it where we should publish and some take home message finally for non institutional practitioners so you know why should i publish you know i think work that remains unpublished in one form or the other is essentially incomplete or undone you know, and if you look at uh, just ophthalmology and you look at the number of theses which are done in a year about 300 at least 
for the MS, uh, you know, for the MS uh, candidates. And if you add DNB, you're looking at anywhere between five and 600 thesis every year. But, you know, most of it is submerged. It's below the eyes, you know, this is an iceberg where, you know, a lot of those that work is actually submerged. And, you know, the problems are with lack of novelty, study design, uh, you know, faculty residents are not probably well trained in methodologies. Uh, there is uh, some amount of apathy still where that is, there's no enthusiasm or there is a lack of interest really in a lot of our faculty. And uh, I think a lot of residents are unaware of the benefits of publication. So I don't think we can go a lot of, uh, in detail into each of these, but you know, this generally are the common reasons. And if you look at one of our studies, which we looked at papers published after they were presented at an AIUS meeting, uh, you know, only 12% actually went on to get published over the next five years in a peer reviewed journal. You know, I think that is a relatively small number or, uh, you know, that, that doesn't really reflect well on, I think we are not putting enough effort into this. Uh, you know, if you look at other meetings, the, the, number, the uh, you know, proportions are relatively higher. So why we should do research is, you know, the first thing that I thought uh, we'll talk about, you know, so on the, on the left, you will see the mnemonic that's famous, you know, just don't get carried away by that. We'll uh, take a look at each of these, you know, so F really stands for fame and recognition, you know, so after doing meaningful research, it makes an impact and gains you peer respect fame and recognition. And that is, I think, something most of us uh, crave for. Uh, patient care, you know, your, uh, you can, your pivotal research studies have the potential to enhance patient care, thereby, thereby influencing millions of lives. Uh, you know, have, we have a live example with Professor Duar amongst us, who's, uh, you know, whose research has really influenced patient care. Uh, and, you know, they have saved millions of, uh, you know, people's vision so far. Of course, it, all this, you know, helps make you a good clinician because there is a lot of deliberation that goes on during the publication review process process, it makes you think hard. And finally, you know, you turn up as a good clinician. In a lot of your, we'll see some examples, but a lot of your papers can, uh, you know, influence policy decision. Uh, you know, don't think that your papers are only read by your peers. You know, sometimes IAS officers, judges, many other people are reading your papers. Uh, they can influence policy. Uh, you know, there are funds and grants, funding and grants, which are available. So your, your research in maybe some niche areas uh, makes you eligible to apply for large grants and funding from international funding agencies. And so grant craft is almost a whole, it's like a whole day session. We don't have enough time for that. And finally, you know, uh, the personal index. So you know, citations will start mattering to you more and more as you go into your publications journey. So citation of your papers helps your personal growth prestige in the medical community. You know, so uh, I'll give you some examples. So doing doing research really is going beyond one patient, you know, and uh, like Professor Dua has really shown us in real life. This is one of our papers, which was done on caterpillar hair and, uh, you know, that hair actually going into the posterior segment of the eye. And, uh, you know, you can see some photographs at the bottom of the screen. You know, I've gotten emails from almost all continents where, you know, it has benefited patients. And what we really found is that if there is a hair in the cornea, the chances of hair be in the retina is almost eight times higher. And a lot of physicians have actually discovered those hairs and you know preemptively treated those patients and uh, sort of you know prevented retinitis, retinochoroiditis, and a lot of vision threatening complications. This is one of our papers which was published in ophthalmology and it challenged uh, you know a basic thought process that intraocular pressure reduction after phaco emulsification does not have anything to do with the ultrasound power. Right, so what we showed is that the intraocular pressure drops no matter which technique you used. So it really challenged the thought process that ultrasound energy is responsible for dropping intraocular pressure. And uh, you know, after this paper, some funding to some labs, which was done by the NIH, which were looking at you know ultrastructural changes in uh, you know in the trabecular meshwork after phaco emulsification actually has been reduced. Then uh, some of your papers can influence evolution of literature on a whole topic. So this is one of our papers on toxic anterior segment syndrome, which was published uh, way back in 2011. And I have actually reviewed about 40 odd papers on this over the last decade. This is one of my recent reviews. So, you know, this was from the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. You know, so some of your papers uh, might make you an expert in the field. And then, you know, you might actually end up influencing a whole amount of literature that is evolving over the next decade. Uh, like I said, some of these papers influence policy. So this was published in 2017 in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, and it actually looked at revising the, you know, the definitions of blindness. And see, the next day, Hindustan Times carried it in terms of number of blind to come down by four million, as India said, to change blindness definitions. Now, these papers, you know, these kind of studies will reduce the amount of funding which will be given to the National Prevention and Control of Blindness. This was a similar study which was published in 2008, which actually, uh, for a fact, influenced the NPCB. Uh, the budget say by in 2011 you know so what's really in it for you of course is there is grants and funding like i already said there is fame and recognition 
let's remember that 90% of the world population lives in the developing world and 90% are the published from the developed world. So the onus really is on us to correct this. And uh, like I've already said, uh, you know, the keyword here is meaningful research. Uh, you can really go beyond one patient. So, you know, after looking at why, we'll try and look at how you can do this. And Professor Dwara has already given us a good, uh, you know, a lot of uh, good points there. You know, so this really goes through a pipeline or every study goes through this phase where you look at the idea and where you get from, uh, then you go ahead and study the design. So you ask the question is which design is the best for my study? Then you go ahead and execute and analyze the study and then you write and publish. So first, you know, we'll try and look at how you get a, a unique research idea. So, you know, these are some uh, about six pointers that we'll look at on how you can uh, choose a good research topic. First and foremost is you can subscribe to e-table of contents of uh, particular journals, you know, say all the top like JAMA Ophthalmology, American Journal, British Journal, etc. I'll give you some examples. You can also customize PubMed and tell it that, you know, uh, I'm interested in uh, limbal stem cell deficiency and I want to see all papers published in this aspect, uh, say on Saturday evening at 5 p.m. You know, the so permit actually will round it all up and send it to you on your mailbox, right? I'll show you some examples. So this is JAMA Ophthalmology, you know, it's where you can just, you know, just say, get the latest from JAMA and you just put your email address. And, you know, every month you will get a lot of these uh, topics uh, in your mailbox. You know, so if you subscribe to uh, at least five or six journals, you're looking at almost 70, 80 topics in your mailbox every month, right? So I'm sure at least one or two might interest you or, or your groups. This is another example of how you can customize PubMed. We don't have a lot of time to go into these, but uh, in details of this, but you know, this is how it looks like. You can tell PubMed, I'm interested in retinopathy of prematurity. And you know, it'll send you an email saying what's new and you know, you can take a look at that. Uh, then you can get ideas from clinics like Professor Dua has already tell, told us uh, you know, with very beautiful examples. So be curious, keep asking questions, constantly brainstorm with people around. You know, hey, I've seen this uh, odd case. Have you ever seen this before? And you might actually see two or three people put their hand up and say yes, you know, so you can have a series like that. Uh, you can join uh, collaborations or groups where ideas are being discussed and try to uh, be part of certain consortiums. You can definitely have journal clubs, you know, so uh, say Pune Ophthalmology Society can have uh, a, a, a monthly journal club, you know, that really helps in discussing uh, new papers and it also sparks ideas. And finally, you know, of course, when you attend meetings, keep uh, an open mind to get new ideas. So attend those, uh, you know, sessions which are discussing free papers and posters. Uh, you know, after looking at the idea, we think about the design. So which is the best uh, design for my study and how you go about it. So in a nutshell, you can you know call it the PICOT approach, right? Where uh, P stands for participants. So you really need to think about what are the inclusion exclusion criteria you're going to use. Then about the intervention or the exposure, that is, you know, what is exactly the thing that you're going to use for your study. It could even be a simple questionnaire. Then you need to think about the comparison group uh, could be active or passive, but you can't think of this after the study is over. So you need to think about it before and think, think about the outcome measure and define it very well. And then think about the type of study you want to do. That is whether it's a prospective or a retrospective, whether you want randomization, masking, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, after the design, you think about execution and uh, analysis. So this is, you know, where all the analysis and analytics, big data, biostatistics come in. Uh, and this is an ebook which is available on uh, my website as well as the Facebook page uh, of my academy. You can take a look at this, it's free to download. Uh, you know, we ha don't have a lot of time to go into all of this, but essentially, you want to classify variables into continuous and categorical types, uh, which can then be binomial, ordinal, or multinomial. And, uh, you know, why you really want to do this is because you want to choose an appropriate test of significance. Uh, you know, you've all, all heard of student t-test and ANOVA and all of these, but it all really depends first on the type of the variable, second on the number of groups that are there, uh, then whether the, you know, the data is normally distributed or not, and then finally use the statistical test of choice. Uh, you know, use regressions appropriately, where, you know, again, if you see on the left, it all depends upon the type of outcome. If it's a continuous variable, you use linear regression. If it's a categorical, which is the most common in generally in all the studies that you see, you use a logistic regression and the output is in terms of odds ratios, right? So you need to understand a little bit of these uh, terminologies. Uh, you know, you can look at a lot of, uh, you know, resources on the website, on my website, as well as on the net and try and understand some of these basic concepts. A quick point on sample size, why it is so important is because we want to really get as close to the truth as possible. You know, you can't really possibly go out and study the whole population. So you need to study a subset of those and then, you know, apply all of that to the entire population. So the sample size has to be optimum. It can't be too less, which is most often the case. It can't also be too large. 
and what it does influences almost everything including the p values including uh, you know how you interpret the study and how you have uh, you know generalizability over the population uh, once you have executed uh, the study you think about writing and publishing so this can be the most you know this can be a heavy weight and uh, you know bog you down uh, you want to really know what are the best practices and which journal so i think the best way forward is to use a checklist based approach where you use a template and you know use uh, the i'll show you some checklists where you can easily write papers it's almost like automation where the methods results and a lot of the discussion can really be entirely automated based on what you see on those checklists uh, so most papers are, have an outline of the imrad format so introduction methods results and discussion this is the uh, resource i've been telling you about it's called the equator network and uh, you know so uh, it has a lot of checklists on the website you know these are some of the examples the strobe is for observational studies consort is for randomized control trials record is for retrospective studies care is for case reports so you know imrad is the format which is most commonly uh, used for almost all studies and you know this is a flow chart which looks quite complicated but uh, you know actually helps you get to the you know the checklist which should you should be using for your own study it's relatively simple to follow so you know strobe is strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology initiative this is for prospective studies these are all mnemonics so record is the reporting of studies conducted using observational routinely collected health data uh, statements and this is something which might uh, we might all look at because we are non institutional practitioners and having uh, sitting on a stockpile of data you know consort uh, quorum moose there are many others other applications of checklists are also in addition to writing your own papers you can use these uh, for department journal clubs also for reviewing papers if you are asked as referees uh, you know journal clubs are a great way of encouraging clinical research in your departments or you know even in your local groups uh, i think the purpose of journal club is to learn something new and also to understand how to critically analyze an already peer reviewed scientific publication you also you know this Sorry, is another, sir, you have last 3 minutes yes so you know this is something that you can use the icmj website uh you know so this is uh, my website like i was telling you it has some free lectures uh, and other resources you can take a look at uh, i'll quickly go through these there are a lot of blogs on this uh, you can take a look uh, you know finally the sort of take home message for non institutional practitioners i think this will interest you more is you know as an inst non institutional practitioner i think it's important to form interest groups locally like maybe in your cities uh, train as a team have the same ideas processes uh, maybe have the same mentor uh establish a local ethics committee it's relatively easy actually it it's not really difficult look at the forsi website uh, forsi is a forum for ethics review committees in india and it will help you uh, and give you a lot of directions on how to go about doing that uh like i said uh, have monthly journal clubs and brainstorming meetings uh, you can use software for data capture in real time that's called redcap you know that will actually integrate with uh, your uh, you know pc or mac and actually help you uh you know get your data out from your emr or whatever you are using from a word or from an excel so red cap is i think something which is very useful uh you know you can use uh, project assignment tools like asana where you you know like professor duba was telling us about you know you have a statistician you have a whole team so you know when you have a group of physicians doing research you know everybody is going to have different roles you can use asana and uh, you know you can actually do this seamlessly you can consider employing a research coordinator for assistance you know who can look at study patient flow data entry uh, look at funding icmr has some extra mural funds look at uh, you know collaboration so this is a facebook group which you can join it has about more than 2000 members uh, you know this is a prime example of uh, non institutional practitioners coming together and doing large scale studies this is the packors group or the pan american collaborative retina study group and so sort of the take home message for non academic practitioners is to you know first of all train well Uh, then design and conduct your studies collaborate with uh, your peers uh, have uh, you use these online resources like red cap asana of course analyze and write your papers and finally choose a uh, particular journal to to publish so that is what in a nutshell i thought i'll share with all of you thank you so much well it was a brilliant nutshell sir um very very informative uh, and I, i i don't think uh, you could have made it uh, any more concise than that So congratulations on the brilliant effort. We have a few questions from the audience which are probably pertaining to your talk. The first one is by Dr. John. What is the minimum requirement to conduct an online survey study? What are the ethical clearance or does it need an IRB approval etc? So see generally uh, online surveys are nowadays relatively easy to conduct you know but I think the key thing here is a questionnaire that you will use and it has to be developed with a lot of rigor. And once you field it then uh, you know you also have to look at 
uh, sort of the you know proportion of people who are actually taking that. If you send it to ten and eight have uh, you know responded, then it's still a good number. You know, but if you've uh, given it to thousand and only uh, fifty have responded, then that's not a good number. So there is no absolute number, but I think we should look at proportions. You know, so like uh, Vitruvan Society of India has about twelve hundred members. So if the study has four hundred or five hundred members, it's it's a good, it's still a good number. Fair enough. Does the number change depending on the on the questions that you ask? Uh, not really. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Dr. Enough. Sengupta, how important is it? Uh, uh, continuing with the same question, how important it is to validate the questions first before actually running the survey? Yeah, I think that's what. So this is a very important question. Uh, you know, I also have a blog on questionnaire development, and it it is can be a lengthy process. So you know, what I recommend is use uh, an already utilized questionnaire, and you can modify it. Maybe you know about ten or fifteen percent. But then using a de novo questionnaire is something which uh, has its fallacies, and that definitely needs to be looked at. And uh, you know, test retest validity is something which is very important to establish before you field it. There's a question from the audience which says that I'm a resident. I have prepared an article, but where can I get a list of all the reputed journals, which are UGC approved and PubMed, Web of Science, and uh, Lancet recognized? You know, so you have the answer in the question itself. Go to PubMed and you know look at uh, the, you know the journal. It has a tool which will help you match your keywords with the journal. So PubMed is a is a phenomenal tool, and you know PubMed will tell you, or you can do a literature search and see which journals are coming up, right? So that would be a list of all the journals that you could target. Uh, UGC website, of course, lists all those as a PDF. You know, it keeps getting updated uh, time and again. And uh, Web of Sciences, uh, you know, that is also a website which easily gives you what is, uh, you know. So, indexed journal is PubMed indexed, and and a journal with an impact factor is an entirely different concept. Uh, you know, uh, that is a science citation ex index expanded. So these are two different concepts. But what we really need to look at is PubMed indexed journal. Try and submit it to a PubMed indexed journal. I just may comment one thing that there are a lot of uh, journals called predatory journals that are coming up. The, anybody who wants to make money uh, is making a journal, making a website, charging you money to publish. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these uh, that have come up. At one time, there was a list of these, but they're growing so fast you can't keep track. And many academicians fall foul of that. Uh, they become editorial board members, editors, this, that, etc. And also, if you submit your paper to them, basically, if you pay them money, they will publish your paper, and they are there to make money. So, the simple thing to do for somebody who's as new as a first-year resident writing a, a case report is just ask one of your seniors, and uh, they will guide you properly which journal where it will be accepted. They will correct it for you according to the format of the journal, and then send it. And and then you're you're on your way. You need that little. So always fall back on the senior who has um, uh, published already. And there are so many role models in India. And nowadays with telecommunication, you don't have to be within your town or city. It could be anywhere. And this question was also asked by Dr. Sujitha Kulkarni on the predatory journals and how do uh, we avoid falling prey to them? Is there an app or a, a list uh, that we can avoid? I think as Dr. Sengupta mentioned, if there is, if it's not indexed in PubMed, then it's it's not worth sending to. Uh, there are some good journals like the Ucornia journal is not yet because it takes time to to get indexed. But that's one very good way of telling none of the predatory journals will be on PubMed. Uh, Professor Dua, if I could just chime in, there's a website called Bell's uh, List of Predatory Journals. It's it's actually he's a he's a librarian who's virtually dedicated the past decade of his life to calling out predatory journals. It's very much online. The website is no longer hosted, but they have cached versions of it. And he's give a detailed, given a detailed list of all predatory journals, which are, you know, pay for print, but not indexed. Uh, B-E-A-L-L. -L. That's his, uh, uh, his name, yeah. last name. Bell's, Bell's list of journals. Yes, yes. But I think it, yeah. it, it was... Like you said, it was pulled down because of some legal challenges, right. and uh, it's not right. been updated for a while. Um, so, but the, the the journals are coming up so fast. Uh, so it may be one resource, but I think it won't be, won't be a complete resource. But you're right; it, it 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 was the one I used to look at, but I think it's they had to close it down. 
if i could just share my screen once i'll just show you uh, you know these are some questions that you should ask yourself when you are looking at journals is is the journal an open access one with manuscript processing fees who are the editors in chief editorial board is the journal an official publication of a scientific organization is the journal peer reviewed what are the indexing services the journal is enrolled with you know who is the publisher of the journal is the journal website up to date uh, you know when was the first issue published and does it have at least four uh, you know annual publications and does the journal or its publisher make promises that are too good to be true Now, so these are some of the questions. So this is my blog. Uh, you know, if anybody is interested, can uh, take a look at predatory journals. Uh, my, you know, I think these are some important questions, and it's yeah. relatively easy to tease them out once you know what you want to look at. And also, you will find the simple thing to say: there will be a post box number, no proper address, and there will be no telephone number to contact. And all other journals will have a proper telephone number, somebody answering at the other end. So simple things like that will tell you that there's something dodgy going on. Oh, wonderful trivia, uh, Dr. Singh Gupta. We have one more question for you. Uh, is there an app for running basic statistics uh, for us to just begin with? Something like statistics calculator, or which is on Google Play or App Store. You know, so uh, you know, it's always better to use proper statistical softwares rather than taking shortcuts. You know, so if you really want to do statistics on your own, the only software which is extremely robust, better than almost anything, and entirely free, is called R. that you know the letter r you can go download mm -hmm. r and then you can actually use it only thing is you need to understand how to you know use r and there are free courses for that as well so r is is the way to go okay the follow up question to that is is there a, a way that we can calculate the sample size uh, without really understanding the statistics behind it is is there an app or a simple way to get that so you know these things are still simple but uh, you still need the software package to do all this i would not really recommend shortcuts uh, right at the beginning all right uh, our 10 minutes are up uh, i think we'll take the next talk uh, dr natash yes. uh, may i interrupt you yeah before yes, we please. proceed uh, let me again make the small announcement that uh, during our annual conference spectrum 2021 we are planning to have a special session where the pos members doing private practice will be given a platform to present their research under the guidance of experienced mentors So those who are interested, please enroll with me. Yeah, you can proceed, Dr. Natash. Um, thank you, Dr. Rujita, for the reminder. Um, next up is a very dynamic uh, uh, doctor. I remember I met him in one of the conferences in AIOS very, very long back uh, in one of the free paper sessions, and uh, he was just brilliant with the with the amount of information that was exploding from him. uh it's an honor to introduce dr akshay nayar he is basically an oculoplastic um, surgeon and ocular oncology his specialty he is done his uh, dnb from shankar nitrale he did his fellowship from oculoplastic and surgery and ocular oncology from lv prasad institute um he's done his fellowship in orbit or vital surgery and oculoplastic surgery from new york i and i i and your infirmary um from sound uh, mount C senior uh his areas of specialty are uh, eyelid ocular surface tumors retinoblastoma aesthetic eyelid surgery endoscopic lacrimal surgeries he's got more than 100 published peer reviewed uh, papers he's written 16 book chapters uh he's a reviewer for 22 journals um, and rightly justified for this talk uh he's also uh, the he's also received the uh, aao achievement award in 2019 he's also received the 2019 apao achievement award in 2018 he received the international ophthalmologist education award at the aao um so uh, with that uh, very heavy introduction um i hand over to you dr akshay nair thank you so much uh, dr natasha is my uh, screen visible now yes it is great so i'm i'll be talking about case reports how, what why and how and how to publish them and uh, i i really thank the pune ophthalmological society for this opportunity for this fan by moment for me and uh, i'm I, and i speak for sabhi sachi to be sharing the virtual podium with uh, someone whom we look up to so much uh, professor dua this is about a uh, many many years ago which seems like a decade now post covid Uh, when uh, dr natrajan had facilitated a meeting and we i was lucky enough to meet you and pick your brains for a while uh, i have no uh, disclosures that are relevant to this talk 
So I'm going to talk about why and how you should go about publishing a case report. This is the overview of what I'll be talking about and topics that I'll be touching so that it can be simplified for y'all. I'm going to go back a little bit in history, 60, 70 years ago, when uh, uh, the smallest case report or a letter to the editor made the biggest impact. This is 1961, a letter to the Lancet, where an obstetrician from Australia wrote a hundred letter, hundred word letter to the Lancet saying, I had seen, I've seen incidents of uh, birth defects in children with thalidomide, in, in children of women who've taken thalidomide to be higher than usual. Have any of your readers seen similar abnormalities in babies delivered in of women who've taken this drug during pregnancy? And retrospectively, now we know how this letter to the editor or a little case report changed the way medicine was practiced. He was the whistleblower, the first one, the index case who wrote about uh, focomelia and other congenital defects in patients with, uh, uh, who took thalidomide during their pregnancy. And uh, that of course uh, changed the way drugs are now evaluated before being given out for use amongst the general public. This is uh, an infantile capillary hemangioma that we all now know the standard of care involves peri uh, oral propranolol. And we've seen that this is safe, this is effective and gives reproducible results. Uh, there are multiple articles in different journals, but that wasn't the case all over. A decade ago, the standard of care was oral and, system, uh, and injectable corticosteroids. And that was what a study was looking at to see the efficacy of uh, corticosteroids in uh, capillary hemangiomas. And one of the children who was in, enrolled in the study developed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the corticosteroid was stopped and the child was put on propranolol. The result, the propranolol helped in rapid resolution of the result of the uh, hemangioma. This was the index case. And now, as we know, the gold standard for treatment of capillary hemangioma is propranolol. Similarly, this one case report uh, of three cases of disseminated Kaposi sarcoma in young homosexual men in the US is what established the association between Kaposi sarcoma and now what we know is uh, AIDS. So this is the impact that a single case report can have. But when we talk to, uh, you know, and I know the target audience is here, uh, is ophthalmologists who are in private practice who may think of why bother about you know writing a letter to the editor or a case report or I'm happy doing what I'm doing. So 15 minutes is quite a long time and I'm thankful to the POS for this. So I'm gonna digress a little bit and come back to why we should start writing case reports. This is a case about a 50 year old, 58 year old patient who had a right breast lump. It was excised and the pathologist's opinion was sought. And from what little pathology I know, you can see a multinucleated giant cell in the center surrounded by hyperchromatic uh, malignant cells. So the pathologist was discussing with me, I saw a case where there was a malignancy on a tuberculous granuloma, really interesting. So I said, yeah, sure. How rare is that? Uh, I was asked. So I said, I don't know. Check with PubMed was my reply. Uh, the reply I got is who is PubMed? So then I was a little handholding going on and I explained what is PubMed and I did a search for the pathologist and there's little or nothing published on coexistent tuberculosis and breast carcinoma. So I said, wow, you should write it up. Where? I said, for a journal. For what? And then there's a little more handholding going on. So this is a pathologist who's now 66 in private practice for 38 years. Of course, eventually the paper was published, as you can see from the last author's name, and a little bit of uh, a backstory. She happens to be my mother, who's published her first case report at 62 years of age. And in the past four years, she's had 14 peer-reviewed indexed publications. So I know firsthand, it's never too late to start write, writing or publishing. Why publish a case report? And I think Dr. Sabisachi and Professor Dua have made my job easier because there are so many points that I'm gonna be repeating from what they've said. This is a peer reviewed process. Whatever comes out in, in publication is something that has been evaluated by your colleagues and peers. So you know what you're pro providing to the patient is the standard of care. There are rare cases that all of us see and we may not have large studies that can validate what's the ideal, uh, the, the ideal treatment for these patients. So by sharing your experience, you're educating others. You're adding to the knowledge base. You can even possibly establish something new. It adds visibility as Dr. Sabisachi said, not just patients, you don't know who policymakers could be reading it when it comes online. 
and it builds your presence. And at the end of the day, it's your permanent place in science that no one can take away from you and it's dissemination of knowledge. So while we know case reports are at the absolute bottom of the pyramid of knowledge, you know, a single case report or a photo essay or something that can be submitted as a clinical challenge as many journals have, do have their place in the pyramid of knowledge. So I'm gonna go about what is a case report with different examples. So we know we're talking about a single case or a short case series of maybe less than three or four cases. So first thing is that in this case, in, when you think that a case is worth reporting, does it have a unique presentation? Did it have a unique treatment or a surgery compared to what is usually done? Now, this is a case that we found in that, you know, I was reading up and I came about, as we see in patients with nasolacrimal duct obstruction, the patient had a swelling over the anterior lacrimal crest like you would in a mucosil. However, there was no discharge of mucopurulent material on, pre on compression. The clinician was a little suspicious, got a CT scan done, it showed a solid mass, he went and excised it, and it turned out to be a nasolacrimal duct metastasis from hepatocellular carcinoma. This is exactly the kind of case that would fit into a rare case report. Something very unusual. This girl came to us with bilateral pigmented lesions on the conjunctiva. We were wondering what these could be, you know, conjunctival nevi, melanoma. We took a Q-tip and just scraped off the conjunctiva and all the pigmentation came off. Turns out the child had bitot spots and the, they had been applying kajal or coal or eyeliner every day. All the pigment from the, conjunct, from the eyelids had been getting deposited on the rough surfaces of the conjunctiva, giving the appearance of pigmented lesions. Something simple, but some, someone had to observe it and make, a note, no, and make a note of it. A case which is simple, but has unique imaging or pathology findings. This is a, a retinal astrocytic hematoma published in the ophthalmology journal as a pictures in perspective. Now what they've done, they've taken an on-fast OCT with infrared scan. They've taken on-fast OCT and geography, which shows the plexus of the capillary vessels at the apex, and they've done a B scan. A single lesion imaged three ways, a beautiful collage, and it actually adds to knowledge. Something similar here they've done, uh, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy to see subretinal drusenoid deposits, which are commonly seen. A different novel imaging technique in a usual, typical common condition gives us a new finding worth publishing. A patient was treated as optic neuritis because of the uh, con contrast enhancing on MRI turned out to be a leptomeningeal infiltration by a recurrent breast cancer. Something that we would normally have not picked up but it turns out because of imaging and the radiologist's help here, we could pick it up. A rare adverse reaction. This was a patient who was on aripoprazole, an antipsychotic, and suddenly came up with uh, symptoms of uh, blurring of vision, which we saw was transient myopia. We stopped the drug, the patient came back to emetropia. Similarly, this was a child with Kawasaki's disease was being treated with immunoglobulin, suddenly developed crystalline keratopathy. And we stopped the immunoglobulin, the patient came back to normal what she was earlier. Now, uh, crystalline keratopathy and myopia for ibuprofen are both listed as side effects in the drug insert in the package, all because of a single case report. You could describe a previously undescribed association or correlation. This is something that we were just speaking about uh, a little while earlier. The first case, case report of rhino orbital mucormycosis following COVID-19. Over the past three, four months, we've seen hundreds, if not thousands of cases of similar condition, but you needed someone to put one and one together to give you what this case report was about. You could even describe a new case or a new manifestation. Uh, my WhatsApp and social media is filled with patients of, uh, I've seen so many cases of, of someone saying that they've seen so many cases of COVID conjunctivitis. We have in India, the maximum number of COVID cases, but the least amount of COVID-19 related literature. Why? Because we're not documenting enough where a conjunctivitis as a sole symptom of COVID-19 could was easily published as a case report. Or something even as simple as an extraordinary documentation of a common condition. This is a vitreous pigmented cyst, but here the authors have used infrared reflectance to show the hyperreflectivity and the presence of melanosomes in the cyst, confirming that it is from the pigmented epithelium. They've done a high resolution B scan, and given us an entire com a comprehensive overview, worth publishing. It adds to knowledge. And finally, as a rare 
It could be a complication, it could be treatment failure or challenge. Uh, we had a patient with a, a, a nasofibro, nasopharyngeal angiofibroma in, invading the orbit and the head neck face surgeons tried to embolize it first. As a result, as a complication of it, the child had CRAO, we reported it. A complication can still be reported. It's not always the good things that need to be reported. Uh, okay, I'm gonna just, yeah. And now this is something that I'm gonna hear a lot of oohs and ahs about. Intrastromal cannula injury. How common is that? When you've had a cannula that's not tightly fixed onto your syringe and you inject and the syringe, cannula just, you know, juts out and hits the cornea, you come in, you take it off, put it back in and continue. But someone actually took the time to document it, to take the high resolution images and publish it. This is something that I've personally seen in so many cases and yet there are so few case reports about it. So, how do you begin? The first thing, like Dr. Sabesachi said, is to subscribe to Journal TOC, is to know table of contents, to know what is being published, so you know what can also be published and what won't be published. The more you read is only when then you can actually sit down and write and publish papers. Look at speciality, subspeciality journals to know what's, what's going on in each subspeciality. If you think there's an interesting case report, you need to take the time to pursue that case report. And uh, like Dr. Sabijachi said, his research academy, the rather online workshops or knowledge resources that like eofta.com, which can help in figuring out how to put together a case report. If a single case report is not enough, collaboration is key because you can always ask your colleagues, they may or may not have, but there are chances that multiple people will have similar cases, which can be put together to form a nice case series. Something that was already discussed about is predatory journals. Make sure you don't fall prey to them check their uh, you know, authenticity before committing. So how do you write a good case report? Documentation is key. You need high quality images. If you make documentation for every case a habit, then you don't need to worry about which case you missed out or which, you, which ones you didn't. A detailed history is, is important because you need to look for systemic associations, associations of comorbidities with the eye condition. And when you look at the patient and not the eye, I'm sorry, Professor Dua, I'm repeating what you said, but at the end of the day, that is key. And also you need to reach to reach out to your colleagues, radiologists, pathologists, rheumatologists, microbiologists. You'd be surprised how motivated they may actually be in helping you build this case report. So how do you begin? You, you first get all your data necessary. Select your journal. Always look at the journal guidelines. Each journal has different guidelines of word limit, references, number of images that can be added. Do a literature search and in your case report, there's always going to be a segment called as a review of literature where you compare your case with similar cases that have been published in the past. You highlight the similarities, highlight the differences in your case and theirs. And if your case has any unique aspect, you need to highlight that. A review of literature adds value to a single case report as well. And finally, once you've done, gone through the entire process is when you can submit. Now, one common question that I hear is, where can you publish a case report? Nobody accepts a case report nowadays, but that's not the case. You have the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology case reports, a, set, a dedicated journal, which will soon be enlisted. You have the AJO case reports, and then subspecialties. You have OCT2 in oculoplastics, you have cornea, you have neuro-ophthalmology, JPOS, JAAPOS, uh, JAPOS, JCRS has a dedicated segment on uh, case reports and Journal of Glaucoma. Each of these individually do accept case reports. And apart from the IGO case report and AGO case reports, none of the others charge any author processing fees. So these are legitimate journals that are accepting case reports. Where else can you publish? If you've got good high quality images, Ophthalmology, the flagship journal of the AAO, but, uh, publishes uh, case reports in a segment called Pictures and Perspectives. JAMA has a clinical challenge case channel section, clinical case challenge section which can, uh, which, where there is, if there's a teaching point or a unique aspect to a case, they can be highlighted in a sequential manner. And of course, you can think out of the box. You can go for uh, journals that cover general medicine in general. The NEGM is a great option for that. Uh, the NEGM has published ophthalmology in the past. You have a case of uh, microspherophakia where you have the lens in the anterior chamber and then back in the posterior chamber and then following cataract surgery a simple case of congenital sutural cataract, but clicked in a beautiful high definition image is published in the images in clinical medicine in NEGM. 
So you can also, you know, look at tropical medicine journals of microbiology. We had a, a case of uh, MSSA uh, ophthalm and uh, endogenous ophthalmitis, endogenous panophthalmitis with uh, cellulitis in a pregnant patient. Uh, and, you know, we looked at microbiology journals and they were more than happy to publish it. So you can look out of the ophthalmology box that we are, you know, can usually confined into, look at pathology, pediatrics, ENT and other allied branches where the case may overlap with. There are also online only journals which are also listed such as Curious, uh, which is PubMed indexed and publishes case reports. So how do you get started? Before you get started, you need to know that when you upload a manuscript, typically as Dr. Dua said, rejection is the norm. So you need to be prepared to revise, refine, and then resubmit. Devil is in the details. You need to make sure you document every little bit of the case uh, in terms of imaging, imaging modalities, et cetera, histopathology reports, microbiology uh, reports, and then add to it. Uh, Jugad imaging, like, uh, like was mentioned earlier, you don't always need fancy equipment. Uh, this was a case of a, a rare case of an eyelid Merkel cell carcinoma, only the third reported from the Indian subcontinent, which we had treated. This is a photo taken, you holding up an iPhone onto the slit lamp with no adapter. It made it to the cover of the IGO. So you, you just need to make things work for you and it should work. A good review of literature is important. Oftentimes your paper will go to reviewers who've published on the same topic. And if they don't find their paper in, in one of the references, then it usually is a sign that a comprehensive review of literature was not done. Also, your paper should always give a hypothesis, whether there's a unique thing about your case or the teaching point that people who may come across with a similar case as yours could learn from. Uh, oftentimes, you know that this case is a, you know, a difficult case and the patient isn't following up. You may have to run behind your patient and call them back to get, make sure they have follow up so you can get more data from them. And, uh, and, and sorry to interrupt like, you, the last two minutes. This is my second last slide. Uh, and like Professor Dua said, always keep a cache of uh, interesting cases or googly cases. You never know what can be published. Uh, also, this, before I sign off, there's, a, there's always, uh, you know, you should always keep your eyes and ears open for opportunistic publications. Since the pandemic, we've been able to, you know, pull out different surveys on COVID-19 related practice patterns. Uh, what is the impact on training? What is the impact on, of, tele, of telemedicine in oculoplastic surgery, on lacrimal surgery? And you'd be surprised, our single paper published last year has nearly 100 citations in less than a year. So you never know what a single paper can snowball into. Uh, and with that, I hope that we have enough, we've pressed you all enough to get motivated to publish and start uh, you know, writing our papers, if not anything, at least with a case report to start with. Yeah, Abdri, what, Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for a letter to nature. Yeah. So who knows your next, you know, your next uh, letter to the editor or case report could get you a Nobel. Mm -hmm. A wonderful validation of uh, uh, with, with that small story, Professor Dua, and a brilliant talk, uh, Dr. Nair, as always. Um, there's one question, how difficult uh, it is. Natasha, to... uh, can I interview once more? Yes. Yeah, before you go for a uh, question answer session, there's a small announcement again to make. Uh, team POS invites case reports or case series from rare or interested clinical scenarios for POS members for our next poster edition. So please contact me regarding this. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Rujita, for that uh, information. Uh, there's one question, Dr. Nair, for you, which is um, how difficult or how easy it is to put up a negative finding uh, as a case report, which is um, contrary to what is already published. As a case report, I suspect it's going to be difficult whether uh, you know treatment was a, a particular uh, a particular treatment plan worked or not. You know, possibly did not work. It's going to be difficult to put that across. Uh, in case series or larger cohorts, negative findings do help. But probably as a single case report, uh, you know, positive findings tend to get fine favor with reviewers and uh, editors. Uh, Professor Dua and Dr. Sabisachi, your thoughts? Uh, I feel, you know, if your if your case report is 
flowing contra to the accepted norms and it's standing out. So if everybody's saying this treatment works, this treatment works, and you've got one where it didn't work, and you can make an, a, a, a theory or a hypothesis of why it didn't, then it becomes the first case where that didn't work. And then the other might go, oh, yeah, I also had one. Then you find that this technique doesn't always work. So it's like somebody has to have the courage to say that what everybody's saying is right is actually not right all the time. So that's a negative uh, result, but it's still a positive contribution. And how easy is it to publish itself? It it depends on the editor. If you if you send it to the editor, uh, and there are like like it was pointed out quite nicely, so many journals now only on case reports, and they're specialty specific as well. There's BMJ case reports, as AJO case reports. They will take it because they have. Uh, I mean, they get lots and lots of people sending to them. But if if it is of significance and importance, they will take it. At least you can try. I think it has to be really backed by strong science, you know, so, you know, at least, you know, some hype, say the hypothesis has to be backed by a histopathology or a genetic test or, you know, some you know, good kind of imaging or, you know, whatever it, it, it may be, you know, say, you know, non, non penetrating glaucoma surgery hasn't really taken off. And that's because it really started with only one or two groups saying, oh, it doesn't work in my hands. And now we know it really doesn't work in a lot of hands. Right. But, then, you know, that initial report had a lot of histopathology of the trap meshwork and a lot of things that showed that you're not really cannulating the Schlems canal very easily. And, you know, then a whole load of NPDS have come from that on, on how you uh, identify the Schlems canal and all of that. So it really has to have very strong uh, backing for you to go against the norm. And it really isn't uh, very easy to publish. The rigor has to be shown, you know, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. But, you know, even, even so, in real life scenarios, if 20 doctors are doing it, it's not working in the hands of 10. It's very, very significant negative finding. That means the technique is so difficult or the explanation is not right for, so that others can follow it easily. So in, if it works in the hands of two, but majority doesn't work, that's the real life situation, which is negative. Therefore, it needs to be told. I, I mean, as an editor, I take that view, but not all may take that view. So if you have any negative case reports, send them to me. I think I would look at the rigor in that has gone behind that kind of finding. If, the, if it's yes. significantly rigorous and the authors have put in that effort, and then by all means. So I would like to ask a question to all the speakers. Uh, and this is a, a, a common experience which we have particularly in conferences where the statement is made, something works in my hands. And we know that probably it's not published or it's not out there. How much credence or how much value would, would you give to such statements? If I have to answer it, if, 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 if yeah, Dr. Sen Gupta says it, I will give it more value than if somebody who I completely unknown says it. So it's not only what they're saying, who's saying, and what evidence they're presenting to say that. Uh, it is true, and like we just heard that, you know, the deep sclerectomy works in my hand, but it doesn't work in my hand, is because there is some technical challenge uh, there. Um, it's true with every specialty, you know, DMEC is so difficult a procedure. Many people have not taken on to it until it starts working in your hands. But that doesn't mean you should not try, go back to the wet lab, do more, but don't take anything at face value for granted. So many times it is actually wrong. I mean, they say works in my hand, go try it for yourself and, and we do it in eye bank eyes. And then, um, and then you have to, when you're trying it in a patient where if it fails, yeah, you will change to the full thickness graph or something then. So always have a backup plan for that patient if it doesn't. And then take the patient along, talk to them saying, this is what I'm going to try. It's a new technique. If it works, it's going to be very good for you. If it doesn't, we'll go back to our default option. And most patients will be willing because they trust you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when somebody says, oh, this is a new technique and it works, uh, I tend to look at how different it is. Is it just a small tweak or is it really you know, significant or substantially different? So, so when someone says, oh, I do, do this uh, glued IOL slightly differently and it works in my hands. But then, you know, it might almost be 80, 90% similar. Uh, as opposed to somebody who says, oh, I have designed a new IOL and, you know, it's relatively easy to exterior eyes and 
you know it gives great results now that is something that i would actually you know uh, look at and also i would you know tend to sort of cajole the authors into uh, you know giving me comparative data i think that is where the real science lies so if somebody is really doing something new they need to show to convince the community i think it's important to show how good it is not just that it is better but also how good it is yeah and just to add to dr sabesachi's comment at the end of the day it's easier to compare drug versus drug treatment regimen versus treatment regimen as compared to a procedure versus a procedure because there's always a surgeon factor involved and even though you may have an rct that data is always a little uh, difficult to you know interpret but uh, you know uh, to take word off a single person to say you know it works in my hand uh, is precisely the reason why we need validated papers that compare a previous procedure with a particular procedure and look at the same outcomes so uh, my answer would be with a pinch of salt is how i take uh, it works in my hand yeah i think you are very right we have to be cautious but you shouldn't completely uh, uh, ignore it or condemn it if you look at uh, what happened to this history of cataract surgery always a new procedure came a slightly new a slightly new history just the evolution of lens implants as you gave the example it's been phenomenal and if harold ridley was condemned and he was for his intraocular mm. implant we would not have got where we have and when you change from extra capsule to faco we have done more cornea grafts for faco related endothelial decompensation than we did for extra capsules but there was that learning process and patients paid the price but today if you're doing extra capsule you're condemned everybody is doing faco and now femtosecond has come and it's going to the same arguments is it really make a difference is more money for little gain maybe one day it will tell us it's better so every new procedure goes through that process in cornea same from penetrating grafts to endothelial grafts from dsec to dmec is going through the same evolution so every new and these are distinct new steps for the same concept but they're quite dramatically different so you you have to take it and the other common pitfall is we all say oh, well extra capsule works very well in my hands why should i fake it that is what people used to say of my generation when they were not willing to transit from extra to faco and the same they're saying you know dsec works so well for me why should i do dmec or ultra thin dsec works so every time there is that kind of a, 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 a conundrum but we move through it and science will eventually sort all this out in the right procedure that most people can do and the patient benefit will then prevail and we go through that all the time in every lifetime we have that that sums up the entire story of science uh, from the evolution itself um yes. we we have uh, one question that is uh, specifically directly directed to you sir this is by dr uh, shalaka agarkhekar the question is which is better option informed consent or real consent and request to treat consent um replace real or informed consent i think uh, documented consent which is informed it all depends on you know what is the prevailing practice and what is accepted as norm in the environment you work in if there's a very litigious society and nowadays most most cases in the uk i do a lot of medical legal reports is because the consent was not proper not informed so if you are going to do something as or this thing has this complication uh, and the patient was not told so for example if i take do a patient's cataract in every every um uh, consent form i have to say okay uh, what are the infection hemorrhage second operation loss of eye loss of vision macular edema corneal edema vitreous loss you know and floater sometimes you put that and so at least these 10 things i have to write and explain to them now in india you may not want to some people may not be doing this so what the judge will say mm-hmm. is that if this is what everybody is writing why didn't you do it what what will although these principles have also changed but the standard principle was what does the majority of a reasonably practicing doctor do 
in your community, in your specialty. And if he does this and you have deviated from that, then you have fallen. That was the test they apply in, in legal cases. That has changed now and, and it is a bit more specific and you have to tell them everything. So a lot of these things come into play. I think uh, Indian, uh, you know, India is guided by the Schedule Y, which is, uh, you know, given by the ICMR and the DCGI also follows that. And, you know, we are, we need to differentiate between a study and, you know, routine clinical practice, right? So, uh, you know, if you are a physician in non-academic practice who wants to do retrospective studies, say in the future, but, you know, your data is getting collected real time, but then when you're collecting the data, you can't tell the patient, I'm going to use your data for, you know, particular study. So, you know, it makes sense to have a blanket sentence in your, uh, you know, consent forms, which says that, you know, your data may be anonymously used uh, at a later date for, you know, improving science or research or something like that. So a lot of these large institutions actually have a form like that. So that covers your uh, retrospective studies. Uh, you know, I completely agree with uh, Professor Dua when we talk about, you know, routine clinical practice that, you know, the, the, the more you say, the less it sometimes may be. And, uh, you know, there's a fear of, of course, losing some patients because you are, you know, declaring everything. So I think there is a lot of differences in terms of where we are and how litigious the society is. But for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, studies, I think that blanket consent is something that I use for most patients that I see in, in the OPD. And, you know, you could do that as well. And you know, a lot of people have the misconception. There were some questions as well, that if the, the patient is not identifiable by the photograph, why should you need a consent? But it goes way beyond that. So if I write a, you know, a, a, a 25-year-old hospital doctor um, had this problem and she then was treated like this. Now, and then nothing else was told, but if that patient can identify herself in your text and she wasn't asked, she can sue. And the BMJ paid 1 million pounds to one patient whose description was given without a picture or anything, even not the address, but she could identify herself as the doctor they're talking about. And then she, maybe some of her relatives would know. And so her information has been used without her consent. And the patient possesses the information. It belongs to the patient. So you cannot say that a consent was not necessary. It still is needed. There's one. Have a, uh, Two more minutes for the discussion, and then we hand over to Dr. Seema. Yes, Dr. Pranthi, you were saying? Yeah, there's one cheeky question, actually. Uh, how, many, how many of you actually read each and every reference that you would be using from the first page to the last page in whatever publication that you're going to have? And I mean, uh, it's a hell of a lot of work there. So, uh, My you... answer is I don't. I, I just read the reference to find a point that I'm supporting. So if I say, if I'm making certain statements in the introduction or in my discussion, and if there's a reference that supports that, then I will use it. I will read a fair bit of it, not from cover to cover, page, the first word to last word all the time. But um, if, you, if, if you have to support what you are saying or what uh, the background you're building, you need the references. Equally, I can tell you that you can find the reference to support your view and ignore the references that don't support you because there are all kinds of references and there's always controversy. And there's always a gray area. And very, very few things are absolutely clear cut if you're looking at the, you know, the cold face of research because things are evolving. So you find the references that suit your hypothesis or your theory, and then others will come back at you with others, but you can always find one that, that suits you. Uh, what I do is, you know, there are, uh, depends on the discussion and, you know, what are the points that you're actually wanting to discuss. And you know, there are, of course, for and against. So I would, you know, tend to read the methods and the results alone of those papers. You know, and those I would read because, you know, you want to see how closely the, that study matches your sort of paper and how closely mm -hmm. the results match yours. So read the methods and the discussion of maybe four or five of those you know, pivotal papers, which you are using for your uh, own purpose and you know, the others can 
uh, we need uh, so i make it a point to read the abstract just to make sure that you know uh, you know sometimes authors can be cheeky like your question and uh, you know the the title may be misleading so i tend to read the abstract of almost all of them but the entire paper only is maybe four or five yeah. yeah it's difficult for original papers but little easier for case reports because most journals have a limit of about 10 references so the least you can do is read those 10 papers cover to cover so and yeah but i i i tend to agree with professor dua uh, focus on the main parts but yeah reading every word of every paper you've cited is difficult you can pick and choose what view you want to put forth and the data that supports it because like you said there's enough evidence that supports all kinds of views contrarian or agreeing to we just have uh, well most of the questions have been answered in the chat box uh, this is just a note to the audience uh, professor dua dr sain gupta and uh, dr nair have already answered most of the questions uh, just one question um, that has come to my personal chat is um, how much time can we wait for the journal to review or reply it becomes really frustrating when they take so many months to reply saying it is review it is in review or it is rejected what is the ideal time to wait you know it, there is it is a thankless job you don't get paid for it the only reason i do it is because somebody is doing mine you know uh, and uh, there was a time and i tried to introduce this concept with the bjo you know the air miles concept so every paper i review give the reviewer some points so that at the end of the year he can collect his points and have free colors or free reprints or free issue of the journal they they said no we've got 150 odd journals and we can't do this for everybody and so on but it is so so they take the time you know if, if what used to happen with me uh, is if i am going to review only on a saturday mm. and and if i'm busy then a saturday is gone then it wait till next saturday and the, it can take a long time for the reviewer to review and uh, then it sits in the editorial and the editor is on leave or he's ill then it takes and it is very frustrating uh, from both sides but there are many many reasons behind it and because it has no reward it's not a job it is just a favor you're doing you can take your time and they do but the the, the editors have policy if you if you don't accept within a week they take your name off and send it to somebody else and then you have to give back in two weeks and they send you reminders or three weeks and if you don't send in three weeks then they will take you off and give it to another one so you can see the whole cycle starts again and weeks go by so you can understand why this happens but other than withdrawing your paper there's nothing you can do about it and i've also noticed professor dua editors like you are now uh, learned a lot and almost always on a saturday morning i get a reminder for a reviewer so they know that people review on a saturday and that's when they send you a reminder saying your paper is due in 10 days but we're choosing that's a saturday true. to send you yeah. a reminder so uh, you know my take on this is for someone who is you know look at your paper and whether it's a really common thing or it's a really relatively very rare thing and uh, which actually you know say a pathology kind of paper or something which is talking about histopathology very niche it takes a long time to find reviewers and you know if that one reviewer says no you really have to like professor dua said you know we need to go back all over again and look for another reviewer so it that can take time second thing is you know what is sort of the median time for most journals to review a lot of you know the good journals will give it on their websites where the turnaround times are actually given you know so mostly you know journals would do it at 6 to 8 weeks uh so if it's beyond that you know for that particular journal sometimes journals take longer times like 3 months or whatever uh so what is the time it's sort of reported by the journal and how much time has it passed if it's more than twice that time then you know you're you're the unlucky one among all that and uh, so this is another way that you can do it of course you know you can write to the editor try and get a response out of them and you know see where that paper has gotten stuck and you might get lucky with if you know the editors are proactive they might actually you know take interest and you know move it along so you know that is something that you can do but you know lastly alas you might have to draw the paper but uh, shouldn't come to that and if your paper is rejected don't get disheartened send it to a higher impact journal that's what i always do if the bjo rejects i has to send to ophthalmology and you'll be surprised a number of times it's accepted and sometimes it's it's a very very inaccurate science this peer review process so you have to just live with it 
and similar paper like yours will be accepted and yours will be rejected and you wonder why and you know you keep wondering but that's the way this game is played so just always don't be disheartened send it to another journal it will it will find a place somewhere just one last question in a simple yes or no can you suggest a reviewer uh, to the journal can can a person who's writing the manuscript suggest the reviewer yes yes it's always possible a lot in fact, of, lot of journals to... allow that and they also ask you to say who you more than that they also ask you opposing reviews yeah but you know something that, that there's a lot of research done on this most of the reviewers you propose or you suggest are the most harshest reviewers often they are the ones who give the worst comments compared to and that has been proven in in many such uh, studies done on the reviewers you know proposed versus randomly selected there is no difference it might be the other way around. So you know the ICMJ is right. the is the international body which gives <clears throat> guidelines for these, and they clearly spell this out that you know the, the author must uh, have a choice to suggest. You may skip it; it may not be you know always essential. But the ICMJ has clearly spelled that out, and uh, you know so there is this committee of publication ethics which actually takes up a lot of these issues about authorship and all of that. And you know these points have been highlighted where all, you know journals which don't allow that uh, somehow might be looked down upon. So most journals do allow it. Uh, but authors should should use that with uh, their discretion, like Professor Du has already said. Because you know, time and time again, you know, sitting on the editor side of things, uh, you know, we see that you know that is often the case. When you suggest someone's name, you know, they might be the one who <laughs> who doesn't who does justice maybe to the paper, but not to you. <laughs> right. I want to answer the question, Doctor Harshvardhan. Yes. I, I'm just going to take fine. one minute. Yeah, uh, Professor Du, I wanted to ask you. There is a now whole uh, a new movement of open peer review where a lot of uh, journals uh, especially the the online ones the new millennial journals yeah. allow the published paper uh, to be published alongside the reviewers names as well as their reviews uh, yes. what is your thought on that i think it it has to evolve so this is you know the, you, and it's not only the open peer review but the post publication review post process uh, because many papers are actually rejected or Will be drawn by from journals because the 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 readers have found flaws with it after it was published and it went through their peer review process. So it is evolving, and there is even the other side of the story where you can publish a paper which you have submitted or about to submit to a journal. So it's it's published online, uh, and then if the journal rejects it, you change the status. But already people are reading it, and it is. Citable and index, so this whole process at both ends is is increasing. But something nobody so far we haven't touched upon, but there's no time for it. Is fraud in science? It is growing absolutely yeah. exponentially, and so much wrong <clears throat> is happening. Therefore, as peer reviewers, you have to be very vigilant, and as editors, because people are publishing cheating, and there are hundreds of examples, um, and there are even A paper written on how to stay published. You know, once you publish a paper, it doesn't mean it will remain because anything you've done wrong can be picked up, or anything you've done unknowingly wrong, the statistics is wrong, or the reference is wrong, or can then be withdrawn later. So there's a lot on fraud that happens. You know, misrepresentation of data, falsifying data. Unfortunately, we'll have to end the discussion. Obviously, wanting for more, uh, I hand over uh, uh, the podium, a virtual podium, to uh, Dr. Sima for the vote of thanks. Uh, yeah, thank and before you. before Dr. Sima proposes the vote of thanks, I would really like to thank Dr. Sima because when while we were discussing that what would be the first POS event, then she suggested this topic of research methodology. So thanks to Dr. Sima. Yes, Sima. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rujita and Dr. Natasha. Good evening, all. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Seema Khare, Treasurer POS. A presently vote of thanks. I would like to thank today's speaker from the bottom of her heart for graciously accepting the invitation, guiding all of us with your expertise. Special thanks to Dr. Dua, Pro Professor Dua, for taking out time from his busy schedule. Uh, thank you, Sen Gupta sir, uh, Dr. Naya sir, for educating us and giving inputs that would definitely encourage private practitioners like me to write paper in scientific journal. Special thanks to Udayan Dixit sir for taking extra effort in making this meet happen. 
and his precious input and uh, for making the discussion very interesting i thank panelist dr mandar paranspe sir also for his inputs and efforts uh, thank you professor natasha pahuja for moderating session uh, i thank our dynamic president pos uh, dr sanjay tekode and enthusiastic secretary dr rujuta machwe for organizing such a wonderful webinar uh, i want to repeat my announcement we don't want to stop here just by conducting the webinar but we plan to undertake the program for peers members who are interested in research to give them a platform under an experienced mentor and later an opportunity for them to present at special session in our annual peers conference spectrum 2021 so those who are interested please enroll with the secretary dr rujuta machwe uh thank uh, to the team of digital for giving a technical support and yes a special thank to our audience for their overwhelming response it is your passion for knowledge that would keep us going and growing so uh thank you one and all and i hand over to dr rujuta for concluding words so it was a great session i would just like to ask one thing uh is ai going to replace this review in future reviewing of journals can anybody answer this i think uh, professor, yeah professor tuwa she wants to know will ai Artificial replace uh, reviewing of journals i think artificial in there are already lot of programs like you know plagiarism checks and all that kind of stuff um technology computer technology large databases will certainly help eliminate a lot of uh, of the issues we are dealing with today but remember all artificial intelligence is created by human intelligence and the human mind finds ways around many things so at the moment um uh it it is it is possible i think it will come into play in many different ways uh, it is covering every field uh, but wait and see i mean it, it there will be a lot of papers that and information generated from artificial intelligence uh, but whether it will be good in policing uh, publications will, remains to be seen so there is a book called 21 21 lessons for the 21st century by yuval noah harari he is one of the i think one of the top thinkers in the world today and you know if you read that book you will think that by 2030 the whole world is going to look entirely different and so you know why not academic publications under the realm of artificial intelligence but you know somehow i think you know we are we are talking about artificial conscience or artificial consciousness which is probably you know i think eons away so you know it will help us in weeding out the bad things but not entirely i would also recommend a book by dr eric topol called deep medicine which is about application of ai in medicine in general and he has a whole chapter dedicated to application of ai in research i'm looking for the day when i can just upload an excel sheet and artificial intelligence can analyze it and publish a <laughs> manuscript <laughs> and just give me the paper that i can upload and ai can review it for all you care currently my academy does that though <laughs> but <Right. it's> annual <laughs> but there's human think, intelligence uh, yeah. yeah i think uh, no matter no matter how many times we listen to professor dua we just want uh, to listen to him again and again it's like yes. you know this ye dil mange more exactly and, i was uh, going to say and, that and i'm i'm sure that even if there's artificial intelligence finally it might go to professor dua to see <laughs> whether the thing was done well the final authority <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much everybody for the interactive discussion so let's just have a quick photo can you can everybody switch on their videos please uh, mr piyush yes so we ready yeah all right got one and it's a good one thank you thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Very good night to everybody. Right. Take care, please. Thank you. Thank Have you, everyone. Take care Thank and you. stay safe.
thank you so, it was a fan by moment like akshay said and you know we are really privileged and honored absolutely for all of us truly, yes truly. thank you bye bye thank, thank you bye thank you sir thank you for joining thank you good night everyone good night, good night. Take, care. take care take care sir yes हाँ uh, अपन का महिला संगित है uh, oh. देविकाला तुझी oh. का है ते एक oh. तैयार कर मैं